Good morning to everybody. All right, y'all ready to go? All right, let's jump in. Okay, our class, why do you Christians believe that? Defending your faith in a skeptical world. Of course, the past few lessons we started it out by saying skeptics, ask us as Christians, why should I believe there's a God? And so we like to respond as we've been acclimated to do. Well, the Bible tells us that, that, that there's a God. Of course, the skeptic may say to us, well, why should I believe in the Bible? I don't know about the, I don't believe in the authority of the Bible. So what do we say then? We may say, well, I know him personally. I have a personal relationship with God and Christ. But to the skeptic, the skeptic may say, well, I don't. So where do I go from there? And so we've been talking in this class about different ways, about different arguments that we have for the existence of God. And we've talked about a few different ones. We started each lesson by taking a look at this verse. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Apostle Paul, since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that men have no excuse. Through what has been made. The idea being that the general revelation of God comes to man by the things that God has created. And that we can see in those things enough attributes of Him to convince us of His existence. That we see that from nature. That we see that from the world around us. And today, we'll talk about how we see that from within ourselves. Now, we've talked about the cosmological argument for the existence of God, which is a, an argument that, uh, that nature, that science shows us that everything that is had a beginning, that the universe had a cause, and that that cause was an uncaused cause. It was transcendent, it was powerful, it was personal, which points us in the direction of God. We talked last week about the design argument for God, that what we see from the universe is so intricate, that it is so complex, that it calls for a level of precision that suggests that it simply cannot be the result of some sort of random chemical processes. That the universe had one shot. We talked about how if we threw up all the dice, filled this room full of dice, we threw them all up and they all landed on six. We got that one shot, got it right that one time. We began to get an idea of the precision that is required in order for us to have the universe that we do around us. And today, we're going to talk about another one. We're going to talk about the moral argument for the existence of God. Now, last week I, I mentioned to y'all, there's a fellow by the name of Francis S. Collins, Dr. Francis S. Collins. This is his book, The Language of God. He was the head of the Human Genome Project. And being very, a very decorated scientist, for him at least, the moral argument for the existence of God, he calls the strongest signpost to God. Now, we've talked in this class about science, and we've talked about math. Um, we've talked about the, the different approaches to these other arguments. But this one today is a little different. This one today comes to us from experiences that we all know from within ourselves. We're going to be talking about things that we're all an expert in. Um, our own minds, our own hearts, our own desires. And this line of thinking challenges us to look inward. So let's begin. Now, how many of y'all are familiar with C.S. Lewis? A lot of y'all, right? For years I was only familiar with him because of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The Chronicles of Narnia, which I, you know, I loved as a kid. I don't know if y'all liked it too, but I really, really loved it. Well, he is one of the world's foremost Christian apologists. And this is his book, Mere Christianity, which is a compilation of radio addresses that he gave right after World War II, where he advocates for this thing called the moral argument for the existence of God. Now, as, so we're going to kind of follow his line of reasoning as we walk through this. He begins by pointing out that we have all heard people arguing, and that we hear that on a day-to-day -day basis. We hear kids arguing, we argue as adults, and there are, we, we, we can learn a lot about human beings by listening to the way some of these arguments go. We say things like, uh, that, that was my seat. You know, I was there first. But we say, uh, leave him alone. You know, he's not doing you any harm, so don't do him any harm. 
or we say, uh, you know, give me a bit of that cookie that you're eating. I gave you a bit of mine, so let me have a little bit of that cookie. And we hear this a lot of time with kids. I love Calvin and Hobbes. Y'all like Calvin and Hobbes? Remember that? I love Calvin and Hobbes. I love it when Calvin would get in arguments with little Susie all the time. We hear kids say these kinds of things to one another all the time. And we, you know, we say, well, how would you like it if someone did the same thing to you that you, know, that, that you did to them? We see arguments like this go on with Calvin and Susie and little kids. We see the same kind of arguments about what is fair and what is right. At the United Nations, with adults, we see it along all lines of society. People say things addressing fairness and what's right and what's wrong every day. But here's the interesting thing about, about when you do that. The person who makes them isn't merely saying that he doesn't like the other person's behavior. What he's saying is something else altogether. He's applying his appealing to some standard of behavior which he expects the other person to know about. You're not being fair. Well, the other man doesn't say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. What is fair? No, instead, what the other person does, right? We all know this from day to day. The other person starts giving excuses. Why, what they did was actually fair, or maybe there's some sort of special dispensation for them. Maybe they've been up late all night, and so that's why they were able to take your seat. There's this argument that, well, no, I'm going to justify myself to this standard. Not to heck with the standard. I'm going to justify myself to it. I'm going to give you an excuse to it. I'm going to prove to you or demonstrate to you why what I did was fair because, or why what I did was justice because, and it looks very much, and I see this as a lawyer all the time, there's, there's, there is a propensity to take this unspoken standard of rightness, of fairness, of decent behavior, whatever you want to call it, and justify our behavior by application to it. Folks might say, no, I know you took your seat, but I've been up all night with an infant. Uh, no, what I did was fair because you see, da 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 They quarrel because they try to show that they're in the right. And the other person was in the wrong. They might try to justify their actions by this standard. They may believe their excuse. But there would be no sense in them trying to do that if they didn't already have some kind of general agreement or general understanding with you as to what that standard was. You see what I mean? What, what that standard of right or wrong was. Now each one of us finds as human beings that we appeal to an unstated higher standard. Now, sociologists agree with this. And they say, yeah, there is, this, I, there is this standard, there is this sense of fairness, like I said, of decent behavior, right or wrong, or whatever you want to call it, that appears to be found universally within all members of the human race, although its application in practice may result in wildly different outcomes. So what is this, this sense of right and of wrong that we have? Well, it's not a, you know, you think about, well, is it a law? Is it like a law of nature? But it's not. It's not like boiling point. It's not like a, a law of gravity because it's not always obeyed, right? If this sense of right or wrong is a law, it's a one that we're all free to disobey. And we frequently do. In fact, it just it seems it's more of an obligation and more of an ought to that we know we ought to act in a certain way. And when we don't, what happens? We give excuses. Or we feel guilt. When we don't, we feel guilt. The point is that we believe in this law of decency and the way we ought to act so much within ourselves, pressing in us so that we cannot bear to break it. So we justify ourselves and we try to shift responsibility for when we do. As human beings, in other words, we all seem to have this curious idea about how we ought to act. We just can't get rid of it. Now, Francis S. Collins, this fellow that I've been talking about, the head of the Human Genome Project, he writes this. And I know that small font for everybody in the back. He writes this. As best I can tell, this law appears to apply peculiarly to human beings. Though other animals may at times appear to show glimmerings of a moral sense they are certainly not widespread, and in many instances, other species' behavior seems to be in dramatic contrast 
to any sense of universal rightness. It's the awareness of right and wrong, along with the development of language, awareness of self, and the ability to imagine the future to which scientists generally refer when they're trying to enumerate the special qualities of homo sapiens. All right, in other words, it seems that all of us have this sense of moral obligation within us that is unique to us, that is something that animals just don't have. Ah, but you say now, okay, but what about people What about people who don't have this? Aren't there some people that don't have this, right? Well, yes, just like there's people that are colorblind, right, or hard of hearing, you find folks who don't have that inner sense of right and wrong. Psychologists will say, yeah, you know, you've got sociopaths and psychopaths. They don't have this inner feeling of guilt or remorse when, when they engage in these types of things. But we find these folks on the margins. On the whole, this is what we find. Now you may say, oh yeah, but shame. Now wait a minute. Rather than maybe this being an intrinsic quality of human nature, isn't this just the consequence of societal conventions or cultural conventions? Maybe it's just learned behavior. Maybe, you know, we see differentiations among societies and cultures across the world. Some have argued to support that, that cultural norms differ widely, so maybe this isn't anything intrinsic to being us as human. Now, folks have looked at that. This is how C.S. Lewis would respond to that. He says, this is not true. There have been differences in moralities, but these have never amounted to anything like a total difference. If anyone will take the trouble to compare the moral teachings of, say, the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans, what will really strike him will be how very like they are to each other and to our own. Think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, or where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. Men have differed as regards to what people you ought to be unselfish to, whether it was your own family, your fellow countrymen, or everyone. But they have always agreed that you ought not to put yourself first. Selfishness has never been admired. Men have differed as to whether or not you should have one wife or four wives. But they've always agreed you must not simply have any woman you like. The point being there is that what we find across societies in the world are some things that are in common. Now, before you say, now wait a minute, there are societies in the world engaged in all kinds of practices, Shane, that seem like they vary pretty wildly from the moral code. We've even had that, you know, here in America, you think about, uh, I don't know, burning folks as witches or something like that, you know, about uh, three, four hundred years ago. There are these aberrations that we see, but in the case of the, uh, the case of my burning as witches, a lot of times these things can be seen as aberrations from misguided conclusions about facts, but we've got to keep this in mind as we look at this. It is true that in different times and places that cultures may have different practices, but we're not talking about what's practiced. We're talking about the sense of what ought to be, overriding general principles that we find in ourselves about the way that things ought to be. Just because a culture practices a thing does not mean that that thing is right, right? I mean, Hitler massacred Jews in Germany, and Nobody would argue that that is legitimate or wholesome or appropriate just because that was practiced. What we're talking about are morals as an inner sense of descriptions of the way things ought to be. Morals are commands. They're not suggestions or opinions. In and of themselves, they are absolute. It's not, I don't like murder. It's murder is wrong. Although, we don't always practice the ought to. And we feel guilty, even when nobody knows that we've had that thought. Now, this idea that there is this universal right and wrong seems to fly in the face of modern day thinking, right? I mean, what I mean by that is if there is some kind of absolute moral law, we hear a lot about, about how there are no absolutes, how there are no absolute right or wrong, and whatever's right for you may be right for you, Mr. Stockman, it's not right for me. I'm going to go a different way. You know, you may choose to, to do this or use drugs or whatever, and that's okay for you. It may not be okay for me. So there's this thing called moral relativism. This idea that, well, whatever is moral in one place for one person in one country may not be the other. 
But there are some problems with that. Uh, for one thing, it's self it, it's it's self contradictory. If there is no absolute truth, then how can you tell me I am wrong when I tell you there is an absolute truth? Right? So, and, and further still, when we look at this deeper, uh, while folks like to claim that it's all relative and you choose what is right or what is wrong, what you'll frequently see is sometimes the same folks don't actually practice what they preach. They might say all things are relative, but they might be quick to agree with you that certain things are just wrong. That racism is wrong. That sexism is wrong. And they'll be quick to say that those things are wrong regardless of where you come from. But you see, if right or wrong is relative, and it all depends, then how can you tell a man in a foreign culture that he's in the wrong for persecuting a minority? How could you tell Hitler that his persecution is wrong? If it's right for him, if it's right for his own cultural norms, if all people are free to make up their own morality, then we got no business telling them that any of their acts are wrong. In fact, they may believe they're right. We may not like what they're doing, but we couldn't call it wrong. But we do, don't we? We do. We don't just say, I disagree with the way that you handle minorities in your country. No, I don't like the way how you jail people in your country for speaking out. Instead, we say it's wrong. And we say it's wrong because we believe there's right and there's wrong that transcends what our culture or our group tries to, or what that group thinks is right or wrong. So, to kind of tie this up, it seems that we are forced to believe that there is some kind of real right or wrong that is impressed against in us and that these notions are generally shared by different human cultures. But if it's not cultural, and it's shared, so it doesn't come from each unique culture. And it's not subjective, such that everybody's got their own. But instead, there is some sort of universal sense of right or wrong. Then where does it come from? Where does the obligation come from? Where does that moral sense of obligation come from? Well, some folks say it's evolution. Right? Some folks would say, ah, well, yes, we agree that there are these intrinsic feelings within us. We agree that, that there are these feelings of, of benevolence and, and, and these urges to act in a peaceful way, these urges not to be selfish. But if they are there, then they must come from natural selection. In other words, there must have been somewhere back in our history of our race periods of time where those genes that predisposed us to act in that way somehow or another helped us survive and so they were ingrained into the human species. So that's often offered as a reason why we've got these feelings within us. But there are some problems with that. One of the problems is that these urges within us helping the weak, helping the genetically marred, helping the needy, they're not evolutionary helpful. In other words, if you believe in the theory of evolution, how does that advance the survival of the fittest to help the weakest? Is that what we see in nature? Why is it that we have a sense of duty to help those who are less fortunate than ourselves? In other words, if this moral obligation arises from evolution, then how do we account for altruism? Now altruism, we know, is that sense that of selfless giving of oneself to others with absolutely no secondary motives, right? We see people like Oscar Schindler, you know, the Schindler's List movie, Mother Teresa, who give of themselves so selflessly in ways that do not advance them in any materialistic kind of way, in fact, puts them at risk. <coughs> What about altruism that we see when we feel that urge to be called upon to help a sworn enemy? We've all felt, all of us, you've all felt it, I've felt it, the inner calling to help someone when they're in need when it's not going to result in any personal benefit to you. And then when we act on that impulse, we feel a warm sense of satisfaction for having done what was right without any physical benefit. How does the evolutionist who tells us that this moral sense has developed over time from our sense of natural selection account for that. 
It can't be that an individual selfish desire to perpetuate themselves. Why? Because it often results in hardships. It often results in great, making great sacrifices. And yet, if we carefully examine that inner voice that we find within ourselves, sometimes that we call our conscience, we find that the motivation to act in these altruistic ways, that it exists within all of us, even though we try to stifle it. So, for the evolutionary argument to hold, it would seem to require hostility to individuals outside our group in order to make sure that our genes perpetuated themselves, right? That our tribe survived. We'll be hostile to everybody else. But that's not what we find within ourselves. And we all know it. As Timothy Keller writes, shockingly, the moral law will ask me to jump into a river to say a drowning man, even if he's an enemy. Now, another reason that evolution can't account for this moral sense is because evolution is merely descriptive. It would only try to tell you what behaviors in the past have been conducive in order to the survival of the species and why you may on occasion feel like you need to act consistently with those behaviors. It does not, however, make any sense. Some of those behaviors that may have caused us to be here in the past may have been bad behaviors that we would say are bad behaviors, like murder or rape or something that generated us being here today. How do we distinguish them between what's morally good and what's morally bad on the basis of this evolutionary theory? The bottom line is that we can. So if evolution cannot account for this, and it's not a mere product of chance, then where does it come from? And of course, y'all see where I'm going. Where does it come from? You, you look at the elements of these things. Have y'all ever heard that expression, red and tooth and claw? And it's an expression that, that uh, is referring to the violence of nature. How animals are predatory, and predatory animals will rip into others, and tear them up to survive, and red and tooth and claw refers to blood on the teeth of, of predators. When you look at the natural world, you look at nature, Nature's a tough place. The natural world's a tough place. And now, me, you know, uh, often today, you know, a lot of us are more removed from the farm than we've ever been before. But the more plugged into nature you are, the more that you're out there, you see nature is a tough place with predators preying on others. It does not, it, it follows a code of violence against the weak, right? Who does the lion pursue when the herd is traveling across the savannah? It goes after the weak one. But within ourselves, what do we find? We find a voice. We find a standard that it is improper, that it is not right to prey upon the weak. That goes against what we see in nature. There's no basis for this moral obligation unless we find within ourselves something that argues that nature is in some part unnatural. But we can't know that nature is unnatural unless there's some sort of supernatural standard of normalcy apart from nature by which we can judge right and wrong. Right? There would have to be something outside of nature. So the moral law does not seem to come from the natural world. What about the rest of it? Well, it seems to consist of prescriptions for behavior and motives, which is how we are acting, which generally speaking is a form of communication. If I have a prescription that has been issued or a month that tells me how I'm supposed to act, if there's a communicate that is a normally a form of communication coming from somewhere. And we find it, it's authoritative. In other words, this urge that you all feel, that we all feel to do things, it comes with authority. This is how you ought to act, even though we don't often do it. It presents us this form in a way of authority. We feel obliged to obey its commands even when we don't. And then finally, number four, we find that it is objective. In other words, it doesn't care for the individual circumstances that we present ourselves in. We find that it calls us to, for example, help the weak, even though it may not be subjectively something we want to do. And in that form, it is objective. And so we've got to ask ourselves a question. What kind of thing has those characteristics? Something outside of the natural order of things that communicates objective and authoritative high moral obligations to us as human beings. Something that has the power to impress these things on us. Something that has the authority to demand our compliance in the way we ought to act. And more than this, since these standards are communications, even prescriptions, there can't be a communication unless somebody's speaking. 
does that not suggest a mind of some kind behind the communication? Now, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity writes that this suggests something which appears in me as a law urging me to do right and making me feel responsible and uncomfortable when I do wrong. I think we have to assume it is more like a mind than it's like anything else we know because after all, the only other thing we know is matter and you can hardly imagine a bit of matter giving instructions. He also writes that if there's some outside mind directing us, might we not expect it to show itself inside ourselves as an influence or command, trying to get us to behave in a certain way, and that is just what we do find inside ourselves. Surely, he says, that ought to arouse our suspicions. So, you come to this. What kind of power has these characteristics? Something outside of the natural order of things that communicates objective and authoritative high moral obligations to us as human beings. Something that has the power to impress upon <clears throat> ourselves. Something that has the authority to demand our compliance. Something that embodies those standards. Now let me back up on that one. If you find within yourself that there are these urges to do these things, that we find inside ourselves that we have these obligations to care for the weak and for the hurting, to be unselfish, to care for the needy, and we find them across and we share with others. Surely this points to the authority that is behind those sharing those characteristics, or at the very least, caring for human beings. So it is something that we could say embodies those standards. Something that cares for human beings. As Christians, we can say that these observations come from the world around us, that they're entirely consistent with what we believe in God. Now, as Christians, we look to the Bible and we also see support for it coming from Romans. Look at here. Look at this. Look what Apostle Paul writes. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. All right, what's he saying? Well, what he was saying with respect to the law, he's talking about the Jewish law, right? Ten Commandments, right? The Jewish law. He said, what about these Gentiles who don't have that? You know, as Christians, we often ask, well, what about the folks who live, what about the natives in here and who never hear the Word of God, right? We've all asked that question before. Here's what Apostle Paul says. He says, hey, look, they are a law unto themselves in that they show the work. And you think, a law unto themselves? Well, what is that? Show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. What Apostle Paul says, what he's saying is this stand, this argument of the moral law. He is essentially saying, hey, within all of us, there is built in. There is some built in code where we know what is right and wrong and it is this inner sense of right or wrong that even Gentiles who are without the law find within themselves. The Catholic faith expresses it like this. In the depths of his conscience, man detects the law which he does not impose on himself but which holds him to obedience. Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a man. There he is alone with God whose voice echoes in its depths. So what we find in the Bible is actually references back to this idea that these, this, this moral code is written on our hearts. Timothy Keller, who I've quoted a few times, he argues that really this moral argument for God it's just a signpost that tells us that people already really know about God and they just repress the knowledge to themselves. He argues that this unavoidable moral obligation that we find within ourselves doesn't allow us to live life like these standards are all relative. Instead, in actual practice, that we actually treat some principles, some moral principles, as absolute. And he asks what gives us that right. Going again, he says, if it's all relative, then what does it all matter? But we don't act like it's all relative. We believe that racial genocide is wrong. That racism is wrong. But if it's all relative, it's just a man's preference. But we don't act like that. He says, no, we don't. And we don't act like that. This inescapable belief that these moral standards 
do really exist outside of us. And as Christians, we say, that makes sense because there is a God that has imprinted those things with us. As Timothy Keller writes, if the world's made by a God of peace, justice, and love, and that's why that we know that violence, oppression, and hate are wrong. If the world's fallen, broken, and needs to be redeemed, that explains the violence and the disorder that we see. He says, hey, look, once we realize the situation, we've got two options. One is that we can just refuse to think about it. And just go on living our life with their moral absolutes and not thinking about where they have their bedrock or where that foundation. But on the other option, you recognize, your other option is to recognize that you do know that there is a God and that the beauty and love do have meaning, that morals have absolutes because you know that God exists. And it's dishonest to live like you don't know that and yet you have absolutes on the other hand. So, that's the moral argument. And I've kind of rushed through it real quick, I know, because we're supposed to have an abbreviated class, and I apologize for rushing, but I want to do this. You take it all together, okay? We've talked about the three different arguments for God. We've talked about the cosmological argument for God. Everything has a beginning. The universe has a cause. It's powerful and transcendent and timeless, and science teaches us that. We've talked about the teleological argument for God that is designed, that the whole universe, that the earth that we see, everything is based on such precision, with such design, that it suggests there must have been a creator and this couldn't have been random chance. When you take that and you combine it with the moral argument for God, and you look within yourself, because you don't need science or math or anything to look within yourself, and you say, look, I know I have these feelings of what ought to, and you hear from sociologists that say, oh, that's pretty consistent across human cultures. And then you hear folks that are even evolutionists that argue, well, yeah, yeah, it is within us. But they try to come up with these other ways to explain this stuff. Even though if I act on these impulses, it's not going to help me physically. It's probably going to hurt me. And so then you say, what well, is it reasonable? Where did that come from? If you take all three arguments together, then you look back at what this verse says again. <clears throat> His divine nature having been clearly seen through what has been made. All three of these arguments, all we're talking about is what's been made. And if you look at all of them, what it shows you is that our faith as Christians and our belief in a God that is transcendent and personal and timeless that holds to these same values that we find within our inner core is entirely reasonable. And when these arguments are presented, it's very difficult for anybody to say to you. Well, now they may not, they may disagree with them. I mean, I, they may disagree with these arguments. You can have, you know, you can debate, but there's no way you can look at these and say these are unreasonable. What does that mean for us as Christians? That means that we have a reasonable basis for our faith. We have a reasonable belief in a transcendent, personal, powerful God that cares about us, that imprints these things within us. And we haven't even read Bible verse because we see it from nature. So, those are the three big arguments for the existence of God. Now, next week, we're finally going to turn to Christianity and the claims of Christianity and how it's backed up by archaeology and by the evidence that we also see in the world. Thank you, guys. See you next week. Happy Easter.